Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cloud Native Live, where we dive into the code behind Cloud Native world. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome on my behalf. So I am Annie Talvasta, and I am a CNCF ambassador, as well as a product marketing manager at Cast AI. Very happy to be here and very happy to be here with amazing topics and presenters as well. So every week we bring a new set of presenters to showcase how to work with cloud native technologies. They will build things, they will break things, and they will answer your questions live here today as well. So you can join us every Wednesday at this time. And this week we have a lot of people presenting from Ops Cruise. Uh, we have Cesar and Alok here with us today to talk about next generation observability using open source monitoring. But before we get to the topic, uh, I wanna remind you also to join in for KubeCon plus Cloud Native Con Virtual North America, October 11th to 15th to hear the latest from the cloud native community. So that's already next week. So now is the high time to start getting on, on uh, getting your tickets if you haven't yet and see you there as well. And uh, this is an official live stream of CNCF and such is subject to the CNCF code of conduct as well. So please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct, basically. Uh, please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters as well. So with that housekeeping items done, uh, I'll hand it over to the presenters who have amazing content today to share and we'll stay on for Q&A moderating as well. But yeah, go ahead um, and kick it off. Uh, thanks a lot, Amy, for, for you know, introducing us and uh, the opportunity to present to CNCF. My name is Alok, Alok Kuha. I'm the founder CTO of Opscrews and my colleague Cesar, who's the principal solutions architect, will do the presentation and the demo today. Uh, the topic today is one that's always been of interest, uh, which is how do you get observability for cloud native applications? And specifically, uh, the topic that I think is always on everyone's mind, given where we are, is how do we leverage all the technologies especially monitoring instrumentation that's coming out of CNCF and open source to achieve that. Uh, so I'm gonna set this up with a short introduction and kind of state the problem and give you our philosophy and approach as to how we are solving this problem, leveraging the CNCF and open source technology as an example of what all of us can do as we move to cloud native or all actively working and running applications uh, in productions. So with that, let me uh, start in sharing my screen and uh, kind of kick this off. Let's get like a second here. And hopefully you can see this, right? Perfect, we can see very well. So as we said, we are talking about the next generation of observability using open source monitoring. Just go across the legal side. Um, let's start with what exactly is the, the observability problem. And specifically, let's talk about what, what cloud native is, what cloud native applications uh, create new sets of challenges. There are a couple of different factors. Most of you are aware of this, but it's worth highlighting and pointing them out. Probably the number one thing is uh, obfuscation, if you will. You know, services managed, microservices and, you know, cloud native services that are running in the application have dependencies all the way down to the infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. But now we have Kubernetes in the, in the middle. So there is some obfuscation. So you don't see those dependencies. So that's one, which also creates what we call multiple points of performance loss. A service can be used by multiple services, even if it's being brokered through and allocated by Kubernetes or by the cloud vendor. So that creates one problem. The second problem related to this is dependencies. And the dependencies are two levels. We talked about applications down to infrastructure and platform services. The other one is dependencies across the services themselves. And this is because you have a very large number of objects. You could have thousands of microservices talking to each other. You have long chain dependencies, not obviously when those happen and how they may impact each other. After all, cloud native applications are fundamentally complex distributed systems. And then, you, of course, it's not just uh, you know, managed Kubernetes, managed services, you have SaaS as well as APIs. What makes it even more challenging is now you have dynamism. What was great for agility is we could add and take and change services, auto scale, 
but that means the structure and those dependencies are dynamically changing. So this creates a, a significant, uh, what I, we call visibility, but observability challenges to know what is really going on at any time. You know, even if you ignore the load is changing as well. So highly complex. The good news is, and this is where CNCF and open source instrumentation and all the monitoring comes to play, we have data on almost every level. But if we just look at the scale and complexity, the amount of data that you have and understanding what is happening uh, becomes extremely complex. So that's one of the things that has actually become the scale and the complexity and trying to get to the right insights, right? So what do we need? This is where we start talking about, if you think about the problem, and the cloud native way. And one of the first things you, if you understand, if you talk to subject matter experts is they usually understand what is happening because they know those dependencies, those service interactions, the dependencies across each other as well, even as dynamic. So we need to be able to extract that automatically because at that scale, we can't do this. So that's one, capture structure and dependencies dynamically. Second, if you want to understand what these dependencies mean, it also means you need to understand what these applications do. A database works differently and what it does versus a queuing system or let's say a load balancer, right? So this means when you're looking at them, you can apply knowledge of you know, typical IT operations. Shared services can have issues like noisy neighbor. Kubernetes uh, you can restart applications and has to be ready before something happens. There are allocations limits. So all of these means that's the lens a subject matter expert uses. We need to embed that when we look at the application. What is the current state? If it's dynamic, we need to understand for every component what is going in, what's going out, what is the workloads, what resources is it using, what services is it calling. At the end of it, you really need to provide, we need, we need to have anyone in the DevOps team, SRE teams, even the application owners to understand what is happening in the applications. What is the expected behavior of each component and how they interact? Because only then we know what to expect and that there's a problem. So then the question is, how do we get the data needed to build this application understanding? Okay, this is why we embrace CNCF and open source. The, what we essentially have to do and what we are doing is building this analytics layer that processes the information and we just don't, it's not just simply about metrics, it's about traces, it's about flows between them, it's about what's happening in changes in the configuration in the Kubernetes as well as the cloud. Um, it's about logs that provide this information. And if you look across the landscape today, all of them, if you think about open telemetry, all of these are available now as open source instrumentation. You don't need proprietary agents anymore. You can deploy Prometheus, you can deploy Grafana Loki, you can collect them, you can get traces with standards like Jaeger, right? standards like Prometheus, standards like eBPF for flows and so on and so forth. So our thesis and our strong belief is embrace open source and CNCF and leverage this information to do what we need to do, which is understand contextually what's going on in the application, process the data to get that real-time understanding of the application. So what we're gonna show to you today in the demo is how do we take the data that's coming in from this open source monitoring, essentially build out that structure, what we call application graph. And as we understand and understand the interactions and those dependencies for each component that comprises the application, build out this behavior model. Now, this behavior model is not simple. We can't predefine what metrics we have to choose to build. In fact, what we do is don't make any assumptions. If it's a generic container or if it's a known container like a, a database or even let's say a queuing system like Kafka, use all of the information to extract what the unknown knowns are and what influences at any time so we can predictively understand what is expected out of that. That will tell us if there's a problem, in deviations, once we learn this, in fact, we want to do this in situ while the application is running, observe it, understand the behavior across all the applications and use it to detect deviations that will indicate problems. In fact, that should tell us emerging problems. And then because we know the structure and we understand the behavior, we understand how components are supposed to interact, how Kubernetes plays a role, do this global dependency analysis. 
That means check into configuration, check into changes that have been, cross-check with the events and the logs, but also look at what the expected metrics are because that'll help you isolate the problem domains and isolate the faults. If we can pull this out, we reduce the amount of space and time, the space that the ops teams are looking at and reduce the effort it takes to resolve problems. We can now also pull in traces on top of the flows to kind of add more granularity and visibility. So that in a nutshell is kind of the approach we are taking. Think of it, this is real-time telemetry processing from all of that. The idea is to provide actionable insights and, a pro and, and if you will, uh, the actions you can take to correct problems as you see them. And the, of course, the best way to do this is to do show this on demo, which Cesar is gonna do. So Cesar, I'm gonna pass this over to you and take it from there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alok. Um, you know, that's a really important slide you have up there, but we're going to actually jump back to that in just a, uh, a second. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Give me one sec. Perfect. And a reminder to, to everyone listening as well, leave your questions so we can ask Q&A in the end or throughout the, the session as well. So. Leave them to the chat and we will get to them. Awesome. So, uh, so this is, this is our, um, this is, you know, the ops crews landing page. Now, before we jump into a lot of these things, I, what I will do is I'm actually going to deploy um, ops crews into a, a, a cluster uh, while, while we're here. And um, I just want to show the simplicity of, uh, of how you can deploy not just ops crews, but also all the underlying tools um, that that uh, Alok was mentioning, you know, the, the uh, uh, Loki and Prometheus, et cetera, all those are just, you know, a couple of commands away. Um, so this is already a, a running cluster, but I'm actually going to uh, deploy into a separate cluster that I have here. And so we're just going to switch to that um, really quickly. And uh, so I'm going to show here, um, just clear my screen. And uh, first we'll look at uh, kubectl, get nodes. <clears throat> and this is just a single node cluster. Uh, the point of this is to really show the deployment. So it's an EK, EKS cluster that I've got running here. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show the pods that we have running. And uh, it's very bare bones. It's just got the AWS node uh, components, core DNS, and the cube proxy. So what I'm going to do is uh, if I switch over into my VS code, um, you'll see here uh, we have a few commands, right? We're going to add a couple of repos. We're going to run a Helm repo update. By the way, Helm is our preferred choice for uh, um, for deploying. Um, you know, most of these tools makes everything easy. Uh, the Kubernetes package manager definitely check it out if you haven't used it. Um, but uh, and then we have a couple of commands. One is the uh, Helm upgrade, Helm upgrade install for the Opscrews components, and then Helm upgrade install for the actual underlying uh, uh, open source tools. Again, Prometheus. Uh, Loki is going to get deployed as well as Node Exporter, CubeSat Metrics. We'll talk a little bit more about the architecture right after this. Um, and then we're also going to deploy again Loki itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy all of this and then just paste it into my terminal. And give that a go. And this is just giving a status. You know, it's, it's, it's successfully updated the repositories. Uh, one of the um, uh, the obscures gateways are being deployed, and then uh, so it found that it doesn't exist. That's been successfully deployed. Now we're also deploying the um, underlying open source pieces, and then finally Loki is being deployed as well, and we're all set. So that's gonna that that's gonna check in. I'll do uh, I'll look at that cluster again, and. Uh, we just see the pods starting to to come up now, so we'll check in with that cluster in a little bit. But right now, we're gonna we're gonna go back to the existing cluster. Actually, before that, I am going to um, uh, bring that screen back up that Alok was just sharing because I do want to talk a little bit about the uh, the architecture. So give me one sec. We'll bring that up. Um, in the meantime, has are there any questions that have um, popped in? Especially on the want? deployment. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no questions so far, but usually people think about them and then they ask in the end. So I'm, I'm looking forward to all of them. Okay. And if not, 
from the audience, I will have plenty of questions and then everything, <laughs> no worries. Fair enough. So I do want to share that last screen that Alok was sharing, which is our architecture. So um, we just deployed, but what, what is it that we actually just deployed? So as Alok was mentioning, um, you know, the, the, whole, the whole purpose uh, uh, of, of these tools is to observe and absorb, observe intelligently and observe easily without the need for, you know, heavy, typical proprietary agents. The, you know, I think the industry has really uh, standardized on a, on a subset of tools, um, a lot of them from the CNCF. Uh, and so that is, again, what we, what we leverage. I mean, the, really the monitoring layer is, uh, I should say a data collection layer for monitoring is really um, standardizing and becoming really easy to ingest. There's not always a need to go with, you know, heavy proprietary tools. So we're leveraging that. Um, in this example of, of, of the architecture, this is a, you know, five node Kubernetes cluster. And <clears throat> across the top are just your workloads, right? Whatever your applications are running, you might be running in Node.js or Nginx or uh, MongoDB inside Kubernetes, whatever, whatever you're running. Um, uh, that that's across the top, and then in the next two layers, uh, which are in this like a uh, reddish and, and, and blue colors, um, you have the open source components now. So you have Prometheus um, as well as Loki for metrics and logs, and then in the blue you have the exporters and uh, collectors. So for example, um, you we leverage Node Exporter for um, uh, node level metrics, right? C advisor for container level metrics. And it's of course important to not only look at the container itself, right? The, the, this is why we use both. You don't only need container metrics, but also that whole infrastructure layer of the actual uh, Kubernetes nodes that are running um, the, the, uh, the workloads, right? So you need visibility into both. Uh, really cool uh, tool, KSM exporter, that gives you the, the state of the, of the objects inside of Kubernetes. So all of those exporters, um, of course, feed into Prometheus and makes uh, all the data collection really, really simple. Uh, Promptail itself, a uh, component of, of the Loki stack, um, is going to grab all the logs from the actual uh, workloads that are running, all the, all the uh, container logs, pod logs, and node logs as well, and we'll feed them into Loki. Now, th those are the open source components that we're, that we're um, leveraging in here. So this is, this, is, this is what we just deployed right now with those commands that you saw. And then, of course, you've got the actual underlying pieces. Uh, you know, we've simplified it here, but the actual pieces of, our, uh, of the um, cluster are running inside of uh, Linux nodes. You've, of course, got, got the kubelet running on each one of those nodes. And then you've got a Kubernetes API instance. So what, uh, what we're doing is we're also collecting, like we mentioned, it's super important to have events. It's super important, important to have the objects um, that are inside of your Kubernetes cluster. So we will query the Kubernetes API uh, directly to grab and do discovery of those objects as well as um, event uh, collection, right? So all the Kubernetes events, whether it's replica sets that are scaling, um, failure to uh, schedule an image, uh, uh, failure to schedule a pod onto a node because of an image failure, uh, all different types of, of Kubernetes events, we'll, we'll grab all of them. Um, and the other thing that I, I mentioned uh, earlier was the gateways, right? So um, because all this data is already collected, we need to have a way to grab it and, of course, feed it out into, into Opscrew. So what we do is um, we have these super lightweight singleton pods that you'll see here. It's basically one pod per telemetry type. Um, you have the metrics gateway here, which is going to leverage Prometheus's remote write capabilities. Uh, Prometheus will write metrics out. And so um, we'll also grab the Kubernetes objects using the Kubernetes gateway. Uh, the cloud gateway is going to pull into your cloud, your, your, um, whether you're using uh, EKS, AKS, or if you're using a GKE cluster, whatever, whatever that variant is, um, we will go in and, and you need insights into things like not, not just the cluster itself, that's, that's a great starting point, but also insights into the other services that are tangential to your cluster, right? So uh, things like load balancers that are handling um, the connections that are coming into your cluster. Things like maybe uh, RDS instances that you're using, uh, let's say if you're using AWS, you know, those cloud databases um, that you're using calling from your cluster out to those services. It's important uh, to highlight those and to be able to uh, observe those in, in context as well. Um, and again, Log Gateway as well as Jaeger for tracing. Um, all of those are just super lightweight pods that package data up and send them off to Opscrews. 
just want to emphasize a couple of things that are here and sure. uh, so the audience realizes we are not in the data plane. We are only on the monitoring plane because we're sitting on the host, not touching the containers, not putting sidecars, and we don't have to touch the application code. So, and this is again, leveraging anyone who's running production can deploy these. All we have to do is collect that from this open, uh, collect that. So that's all we have to do with the minimum amount of touch. And that kind of simplifies the deployment process and the data collection process. Also, the data stays there. We don't have to store the data away and lock it away. It is all open access for everyone. Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, one, one of the big things, I mean, we are we are talking about, you know, a mixture of ops as well as the uh, as the, you know, tools themselves that that, you know, again, again, things like the CNCF has, has enabled to exist again. So, you know, Prometheus, et cetera, all, all these all these tools, you know, even though we are talking about Opscrews, Opscrews is pluggable. The fact is that these modern architectures for observability tools, including including Opscrews, but even even not, um, you know, even if you don't have this layer there, all this data is, is still there. And that's the important piece. The uh, As I was mentioning, the, the ease of use and commoditiz commoditization of the actual collection tools has made this really, really impressive because, you know, your data is there. It's, it's so easy and you're not tied to a specific vendor. You're not tied to a uh, to some sort of proprietary implementation. You know, all this open source um, uh, tool, all these open source tools allow you to collect and keep that data and leverage it as needed for, you know, business analytics, or in this case, observability, um, but, you know, for whatever capacity planning, et cetera. So. So, so users can use all of this data with or without op screws. Yeah. <laughs> they can build their analysis. We are just going to help them get the insights they need. Absolutely. So I'm going to jump back into, uh, I'm going to jump back into the, uh, I'll just move this out of the way. Jump back. Keep the deployments ready. Yeah, I want to. I want to make sure that this is up and running. And it looked like it came up pretty, pretty fast. But I'll, uh, I will check again. Yeah. So all these, all these are running, and you'll notice. And I'm going to show this to you inside of the cluster as well. But you know, you'll notice um, we have a couple of different namespaces. We have the collectors namespace, and we have the actual ops crews gateway. Um, but you'll notice things like C Advisor, right? Loki, Loki Promptail, um, then Cube State Metrics as well here uh the prometheus instance as well is up and running uh here's node exporter and then our gateways um are are there as well so uh so let me jump into that um cluster itself this is this is actually our demo which we're gonna we're gonna jump into some more of the cool things that we're doing with with those open source tools and all that data that we're getting um but this is just the cluster itself again i just kind of really wanted to show that deployment i'll uh, refresh my screen here just make sure everything's uh, up to date and here is our actual deployment where we were just looking in the command line. So you'll see, I have a, again, we saw that it was a single node cluster inside of EKS. Um, so you'll see that node and, and you'll see, again, you'll, you'll see these components. You have Loki, you have uh, Promptail, uh, you have the Opscrews gateways, node exporter, et cetera. So again, we're, we're now building this really interesting view that I'll, that I'll show details on, but all within a couple of minutes, right? While we, just while we reviewed the architecture. This is all done out of the box. Um, so uh, again, super, super um, cool that we're able to leverage the open source uh, tools for, for grabbing all of this. So um, now I'm actually gonna jump into the, uh, into the actual uh, demo uh, cluster itself so that we can see some more detail. Um, again, this is, this is our, our, our view. And what you're seeing here is a lot of data uh, being represented by Prometa, uh, sorry, being collected from Jaeger, uh, if you're familiar with eBPF, we're leveraging uh, the Linux kernel's eBPF capabilities to actually build this uh, view where you're seeing uh, data flow across. And we do support tracing, and there are a lot of really awesome cases for tracing, but there's also a lot of cases where um, where you might not want to do tracing. Maybe you want to avoid overhead, uh, et cetera. So um, the, the eBPF capabilities of the Linux kernel really allow, allow you to build this kind of view and uh, topology and structure view without uh, forcing the need for tracing. Um, so that, I think that's that's one of the really cool things that uh, modern, you know, um, modern implementation of Linux ha have allowed us to do. Now, before, again, going into all the details, I just want to show one more time the, uh, the underlying pieces in a slightly more complex cluster. 
uh, you'll notice that there's a bunch of filters and stuff across the top. So we're leveraging, again, the, the open source tools make it really, really easy because when you deploy, um, when, when you deploy these tools, they're sending things like labels off to Prometheus and we can stitch those labels together and, uh, and make it really, really easy to, to ingest this data. So now we can actually leverage the filters that are being attached um, to, the, to your workloads and to different entities. So, uh, you know, you can filter by app or you can filter by namespace and all this is just like incredibly easy to do now with these modern tools um i've i've built a view of just the underlying pieces using these filters so i'm just going to apply you know this data collection layer which is going to show us um the ops screws as well as the open source tools so in this case we have a five node <clears throat> excuse me we have a five node cluster uh here these are the five nodes some of their data um but Again, a lot of these are running as daemon sets. So if I zoom in a little bit to like Node Exporter, you'll see five instances of Node Exporter, five instances of C Advisor, Cube State Metrics is a singleton. So you'll see all of this um, and how you know Prometheus is actually going out and scraping the metrics from those endpoints. You'll notice those uh, those arrows going outbound because that's the way the traffic is flowing in. And then you'll see the obscures gateways. Like uh, you'll see here, Prometheus is as I mentioned leveraging. Um, remote write capabilities to feed the Prometheus gateway uh, for ops crews. And then you'll see on here on this left side, the Loki components. So these are the actual pieces running inside the cluster, which is where, where we're getting all that data. You'll see these are actually posting out to our, um, <clears throat> to, excuse me, to our uh, uh, Amazon instances, which is where we're actually housing this particular uh, demo. So, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry about that. So I'm gonna go back, uh, I'm just gonna clear that that filter. And I want to, you know, start showing some of the really cool things that the um, that the underlying uh, tool sets allow us to do. So again, we're leveraging eBPF to to show you this view of the flow of, of the different components. You'll notice uh, the different pods, for example, and you'll also see, as I mentioned, it's important to have a view into other pieces that your infrastructure is touching, not exclusively Kubernetes, right? So you'll see things like Again, as I mentioned, we're running in AWS. So you'll see things like this elastic load balancer, right? And we can actually click into it. And this is kind of what we call our quick view. But if you click into the actual load balancer, you get data related to the load balancer, right? The DNS name of it, the IP addresses, um, the ports that are exposed, and uh, both, sorry, I meant, I should have said private and public IP addresses for the, um, uh, for the load balancer along with metrics. Now this is a metric snapshot. We can, we can look at some metrics in, in a bit. I'll, I'll show you how the context for that works. Um, but again, all this stuff is being leveraged from, from the underlying, in this case, CloudWatch, right? Um, but, but for all the entities uh, as well. So here we have um, uh, actual pods, right? Let me, let me pick something that's maybe a little bit more interesting like that, maybe like an Nginx pod. So if I, if I click on the Nginx pod, again, all the data from um, from the underlying tools, you'll see like if I hover on this, you can see connection data and architecture data, things like performance uh, pieces that we're seeing th this Nginx controller is calling out to the Nginx service with a response time of 57.23 milliseconds over port 30,000. So architecture validation, again, super easy because of the data we're collecting from those tools. Um, and then if I click on, for example, the pod itself, Right, it'll bring me into uh, that quick view again, which you'll notice is pervasive throughout the throughout the platform. And again, we're leveraging the the native uh, data from Kubernetes, right? So the label that was attached to this pod in in the manifest is automatically picked up. And again, as you saw earlier, the the that uh, view that I built was based uh, in part on some of these labels and namespaces. Um, but why, so why is it important to have all this data? Why is it important to have things like the namespace, like the IP address, um, like the uh, start time? All these things are important. Um, I can give you, I mean, just off the top of my head, a lot of different examples, right? Important to have the start time to make sure that uh, the latest config map that you applied um, is now in place, right? If you know that you applied a config map uh, on October 6th, right, which is today, and you're seeing that the start time was from February 16th, you know that that config map is not in use because the pod itself has not bounced. Um, things like namespaces. So a lot of a lot of uh, the companies we, we work with, um, they have giant clusters uh, that, uh, you know, they might have 50, 60 node clusters, even more, hundreds of, of, of nodes in their cluster. And um, that might be a single cluster across the entire enterprise for just their non-prod. So what happens there? You have 
I don't know, let's say seven instances, they have prod and pre-prod and, and uh, stress and uh, QA1, QA2, QA5, and you have all these individual instances. Well, how are you going to uh, determine which uh, um, slice of the application you're looking at? Usually that's going to be segmented by namespace. So it's important to be able to not only look at that, but also you know leverage filtering inside of your, your observability platforms uh, for that. Um, so uh, the, the other thing is, of course, the, the context that Alok was, was mentioning. So it's really important to have context. And I'll actually click on a container to get a little bit um, richer data. Uh, it's important to have that context. So uh, one of the really cool things that, that we do is stitch all the all this data together. Again, the, the facility that's, that, that's uh, uh, available to us because of you know, the underlying tools doing such a good job of sending over labels, et cetera, for us to be able to, you know, stitch this data enrichly allows us to then now do some really cool things like um, contextually giving you access to things like metrics, right? So if, I, if I'm looking at this Ingress controller container, as you see on the upper left corner, I can click on metrics. And of course, it's important to have metrics, you know, <laughs> because you need to know what's happening with your workloads, right? What does my CPU look like? As you can see, CPU utilization is really, really low here, 0.12%. So you might you might know that you that you might be oversized on your on your sizing for the um, uh, for the actual pod. You know, you might be able to get away with reducing your resource limits. We have a view on that, and and I'll show you. Uh, some of what we do with again all this data and how we make uh, recommendations and highlight um, pieces that you know could use some more uh, resource um, uh, so higher resource settings or lower resource settings um, but but we'll, we'll jump to that in a sec but again you get all this you know whatever data is available for this particular entity you will get and that received by its memory utilization again the one thing I'm seeing here just by looking at this is that this pod is severely oversized um, but I'll go back here and uh, things like any events, I won't jump into every single one of these just in the interest of time, but um, Kubernetes events, uh, logs, uh, I think that one is an important one. So let me click on logs. So again, we're looking at this Nginx controller and we're now we're straight into the logs for that. The context is important. Now, uh, I'm, I'm just giving you guys like a sneak peek of what is actually under the hood. But in reality, um, while it is kind of fun to go in and explore all of this stuff, um, uh, the ML is really what brings a lot of this together. So, but I just want to show you guys what's, what's underneath. Um, uh, so, so again, you'll see some, some of the links connections is just like a table view of what it's talking to or what's talking to it. You see that the elastic load balancer is, you'll notice by this little arrow, this is upstream. So you'll see elastic load balancer is calling Angris Nginx. And you can see performance again, coming in from eBPF and from Prometheus, um, you know, performance data around that bytes in, bytes out, latency average, et cetera. Uh, now we, again, I'll, I'll jump into the ML in just a bit and kind of show the real magic behind that. But um, uh, I want to show a couple of other views. So actually I'll go into the node view. Um, this is just another view of, of the underlying data. It's important to be able to see what's running where, right? You might have a, a particular host that's problematic and you might want to know what pods are running on top of that host. So again, I uh, mentioned we have five nodes, one, two, three, four, and fifth node all the way here on the right. Um, so here we're breaking up these views in, into uh, basically uh, doing a uh, kubectl get pods with a filter on, um, on the individual nodes, but showing them all at the same time. So uh, you, you can see the, the workloads. You'll see C-Advisor running on here, core DNS. Um, and you can also see data related to the node itself. So if you're wanting to check the config, maybe you have a node that maybe they're all supposed to be, you know, moving off uh, off of a Docker runtime and onto the CRIO runtime, uh, for example. And you can check the actual config of the node itself and get details. Like yep, we can see that this is still a Docker container runtime, but also things like the Kubelet version and the kernel version that you're leveraging, uh, operating system images. And again, just like we saw for the for the pods themselves, it's important to have the node level metrics, right? So this is again a high level snapshot of, of the metrics um, for the node. Um, but you can jump into it, and again, just just as important to understand how you can see here a time frame selector, but how at any point in time 
uh, your your nodes themselves were behaving, maybe they had some sort of spike, etc. Now again, we we have alerts that will automatically notify you of that, but it's great to be able to dig in and and explore at will. Um, so the other, so the, so this this is um, before I actually jumping out, I do want to show the balancing because I, I did mention the balancing. So in our balancing view, we'll show you. Um, how much uh, resource, how many resources an individual pod is consuming. Uh-oh, it's spinning. Hold on. Let me refresh my screen. I don't think I made a sacrifice to the uh, demo gods today, so. Is the balancing not coming up? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it should come up. I think I'll just miss it. Oh, there but, you are. Yeah. yeah so. Uh, we'll show you we'll show you resource data for for CPU memory and disk, and you can see right. For example, um, let's just pick on C Advisor, right? So we have the C Advisor pod, and you can see that, for example, C Advisor has no request and no limit set um, for it. So that might be something to explore. We can also see that it's best effort, and the current CPU utilization is 195 millicores. Um, and the, but the average is about 124, while the max is 220. So this might help when you're optimizing um, cluster workloads and trying to you know, understand. Uh, so, sir, can you also show them who's hogging most of the memory on their average? Because that's always an interesting one. Yeah, absolutely. So what we can do is we can you know sort by current, right? And we can see that load balancer heartbeat is actually surprisingly <laughs> consuming a lot of consuming a lot of uh, a lot of memory it looks like it's consuming 139 and most uh, users may not know that and i misallocated that's actually you know what this is actually perfect because i am extremely uh Surprised. interested in the fact that the load balancer heartbeat pod itself is consuming this much memory so this is actually a really great find that I'm going so to go back this to is this is where you have to crack things open to understand what's really happening under the covers yeah you know, Kubernetes does a nice job hiding all that, but it could cause problems. Yeah. Yeah. So again, this is this is um, uh, this this view really is specifically around that, right? Being able to optimize workloads, um, make sure that you know your limits are properly set. You might have some some that are crashing or something, and we'll 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 alert on that when you're looking to proactively go in and uh, and identify things. This this view is perfect for that. I mean, it works both ways, right? Either you're undersubscribed and you may have evictions or you oversubscribe over provisioned and then you're wasting a lot of resources right and doing amazing uh, auto scaling out not realizing that's not the right place to better to do drip irrigation <laughs> yeah especially when you're running on cloud cloud is great but cloud is not that's cool. right that's right <laughs> so. I'm surprised how many customers don't do that how many yeah. users don't do that so Again, um, you know, there are modern applications are, you know, very often, you know, we, we know that Kubernetes have, has won the orchestration battle. So, uh, you know, tons of, uh, tons of modern applications are actually running, of course, inside of Kubernetes. So, um, again, based on the uh, Kubernetes API data, <clears throat> excuse me, and, um, and some of the other open source tools, we've built this view. Uh, exclusively for Kubernetes resources. So you can see things like deployments and replica sets and daemon sets that are in your cluster. And these are all, this is this is a nice map, but it's also uh, clickable. So for example, uh, I can look at pods, right? So I click on pods and now I'm looking at, again, the, the magic of those labels that are being automatically collected um, by the under, underlying tools to allow the building of these views. You know, you, you've heard me mention it two or three times at this point, um, but that's, that's, it's, it's really almost magic, right? So being able to grab this, this data around namespaces and what, how many pods are running in those namespaces, um, any failed or uh, anomalous pods, you know, anything that has an auto detected anomaly will show up here. Um, but you'll but you'll see you know kind of the distribution of your workloads, and then you you also have um, the search bar. So if you want to find something specific, like if I want to look for Prometheus, I can do this search, and now I'm looking at my Prometheus pod. But I'll take away um, that filter, and you have a tabular list of all of these um, uh, of all of your workloads, right? So and and I can look at you know the namespace that they're part of, their IDs. Uh, their status, the host that they're attached to, and the IP address for the pods themselves, along with any labels that are attached to them if they're part of a replica set or a daemon set, uh, and then quality of service data, along with created time and start time. Um, but also, again, we come back to you know this this quick view built with uh, the data from all those different tools. So again, you can you can look at all this data, the labels and all the metadata, and, and you're back into there, right? 
Uh, there's, you know, there's, there's other views. This is, this is very similar. But what I wanted to highlight is the richness of the data and the contextuality that having all these um, tools, all the metrics, all the, all the config, all the events, all stitched together, that richness that is provided to us uh, in the context of all these views. Right? Uh, so now the next thing I kind of want to jump into is the alert view. And, uh, and Alok, I think this is um, a lot more pertinent to some of the stuff you were talking about. So please feel free to, to chime in. Um, but with all this data that we are, uh, that we're now receiving, um, once we stitch it all together, the, the, the one thing that, that, that we're hoping to drive home is the smart layer, as Alok showed in the, in the slide, um, the smart layer on top of all these tools, because it is important to have metrics. It's important to have traces. It's important to have network data and config data and change data. Um, but what you do with that data is that's the real challenge that um, I think we're all facing today. The, the data in many times is uh, siloed. Um, you might be using some, you know, some proprietary tools for one piece of data and other open source tools for another piece of data. Or even if you're fully open source, you might be looking inside Prometheus for one thing, directly inside of Loki for another. Um, you might be going directly to the to the Kubernetes command line for uh, for other things. So that is one of the challenges we're trying to solve, right? Having, and I think everybody's trying to solve um, that issue, having that context switching is, you know, if, if you guys are into looking at, you know, brain science, at all, you'll notice that context switching is a, is a big problem. It's a big drain on us. Um, so that's one of the things we're trying to, to avoid. It wastes uh, resource time. It makes uh, your teams less effective. It increases the outage duration, which in, uh, in many cases means, you know, lost money, lost opportunities. Um, you know, if in a healthcare environment could be, could mean uh, losing health and, and losing, um, you know, important time to care for patients. Uh, it, it's, you know, there, there's, there's a myriad of things that could um, be affecting, but the point is you need to be more effective. Um, you need to have this context so as to not to waste time and waste cycles. So this is really what this screen kind of represents. It's really the, uh, the, the culmination of all that data that we were just showing combined with that smart layer that Alok was, was um, talking about. So, we have the we have the ability to set thresholds just like any tool, right? You can set th thresholds directly inside of um, you know you can do alert manager inside Prometheus and and set thresholds there and create alerts on that. And we have that capability to I'll actually jump out here um, just for a sec to show that. Uh, but that's not what we um, that that's not the philosophy that we want to go with. I mean, if you really want to, you can come in here and you can uh, select a metric and and apply a threshold. Right, you, you can say, well, all right, create an alert if I'm over, you know, 200 milliseconds. And uh, if we detect, you know, if, if we detect, um, we'll even provide automatic threshold uh, suggestions for, for workloads that have been um, running, right? So we, this is the current max, et cetera. So, so suggested threshold here is like 0.35% because the, in this case, the CPU doesn't go over that. This is a little bit of our, of our ML, um, you know, in play, but this is not, you know, what we want to do. There are there are a little bit more significant pieces that we can do around um, or, or around really stitching all this data and the behavioral models that are created with all this data. So um, let me let me find an alert. I think we were so one, one when you're doing that, I think uh, worth a comment, uh, Cesar, while you're finding it. And the reason yeah. you cannot rely on a fixed set of uh, thresholds on a fixed set of metrics is you're making an assumption on what that container or that service is doing. And you may not have seen it. You may not have tested locally or on the cloud or wherever. So instead of trying to guess and trying to optimize and tune it, instead of waiting for it to, let's say, hit a saturation limit, it's better to find out when the problem is actually happening and detect that. This is where you want to have the intelligence to be able to understand what behavior is. Is it working correctly? As opposed to when it hits a limit and keels over and dies. That's the whole idea. Otherwise, right. you'll be just tuning thresholds across all the services and guessing on which which metrics to pick. And in a container, you go, you have the choice of picking fifty metrics. Exactly. No, and that's and that's a real challenge. I mean, you know, although you and I were talking about this uh, last night about the fact that you know, with especially with with the ability to um, scale out that you know Kubernetes provides, right? With 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 uh, being being able to scale out the, the on the replica sets. Um, 
workloads are running in much tighter windows than they used to before, right? So it's a lot harder for you to set thresholds nowadays because um, workloads might be running in just a, like a really small window. I mean, everybody wants to maximize their resources. Some might be running at capacity. So when real deviations occur, right, a machine is going to be able to find those deviations much more easily than a human. You know, you're, you're going to have a, you know, one of your one of your ops guys just literally scouring through dashboards and finding, all right, sometimes it's at 91, sometimes it's at 89. So maybe we should set it at like 91%. And, and, and that's the thing. The machine is going to do a much better job. And um, uh, I, that's just my, my opinion. And I think Actually, let fun. me double down on that. This is yeah. where I think the, the, a lot of people realize what has changed in the Kubernetes with auto scaling. Let's say you decided that CPU is at 85% is what you're worried about. So you set a threshold but demand increases and you can auto scale, which means when you hit 85%, you increase the number of replicas. <laughs> That's not a problem unless there are, so why are you alerting when I know I can auto scale? So I'm gonna create all these false alerts every time you try to auto scale and scale back. Right. Container is behaving fine or the application is behaving fine. Nothing to do with it. Increase demand, increase resource usage. But just because I hit the limit and I'm gonna about auto scale is not getting an alert. That's a false alert. If the application wasn't behaving correctly when it's supposed to not hit 85%, that's something I'm worried about. How do you detect that? Right. That's the key. And I, we can't do this across hundreds and thousands of containers. Yep. Okay. So, uh, yeah, thanks for that, Alok. Um, so, yeah, this is an example of, of again, one of the... Um, uh, one of the, one of our alerts. Now the machine learning has done its work, um, but again, the work that it's done is it's it's done on the data that's being provided by Prometheus, and on top of that, we're bringing in things like logs for Loki and context for you to look at that any events that are um, that are happening. So again, it's this whole rich uh, uh, construct and uh, really rich object model essentially of what, what what is being built with bringing all those open source tools together. Um, I'll highlight just a couple of things. This is a, there's a lot of info on the screen, but important to know is that uh, actually for starters, um, we're seeing that some metrics are not normal in this particular hard cache container inside of this particular pod. We're looking at things like the namespace itself, shopping cart, <clears throat> excuse me. And here are some, some of the metrics that are violated. I won't go into these because we have a more interesting view of these actual violated metrics, but I do want to call out what um, Alok was also just mentioning around uh, not being able to, you know, you're not going to know, know. And in fact, many times you might set alerts on some metrics, but, you know, I've, I've been monitoring for, I don't know, 10 years, something like that. And I don't recall seeing like uh, somebody going in and setting in a threshold on container file system reads, right? Or, you know, the, some of these more esoteric or less well-known indicators of performance, right? And I think that's a real... Um, uh, that's a shame, but uh, again, this is something you don't have to do because our, uh, you know, the, the ML is going to do that for you. Again, you're getting this data from Node Explorer, you're getting this data from C Advisor, so an EBPF. Might as well, <laughs> what's a, an EBPF? Correct. You might as well actually leverage it as opposed to just collecting that data and then just not doing anything because mm -hmm. nobody actually knows what to do with it, right? So, mm -hmm. um, uh, so yeah, these are these are this is an example of all the metrics that were taken into consideration. Uh, by the ML to, to trigger this particular alert. But we'll go into the more interesting view of the analysis. And I'm actually just gonna give you a little taste and then we're gonna jump out of this because this, this kind of links to a larger piece. But you'll notice, um, you know, we're, we're highlighting uh, some of the issues, right? We have uh, this fishbone RCA that we call, which really shows you um, different categories of metrics and configurations that, uh, have, that, that are probably important to this scenario. Um, file system is not involved. This all grayed out. Green and gray mean you know they're the good or, good or not involved. But I'll highlight just the category. So configurations have changed. Supply side workload is having issues. That's why some of these are red. Demand side workload is having issues, and so is CPU. We'll jump back to this. I just wanted to give you a taste of this is an auto detected anomaly by the um, by the ML right with all that underlying data that we've collected. Um, but let me step back just for a second to show something. Um, here we have another alert that's saying that our response time, uh, we have an SLO breach on this particular uh, service, right, the Nginx service. And it's saying that we have an SLO value of 2,500 milliseconds and, uh, and that we're actually responding at over 3,500 milliseconds. So we're at three and a half seconds of response time. Um, 
that is of course important, right? So, so somebody is deemed that this SLO um, is important to set, and now it's being violated. So, uh, what our ML is doing is it's looking uh, up up the stack, down the stack, upstream, downstream to identify where there are actually issues that could be affecting and causing this particular SLO violation. So again, even just just visually, right, we can see that there are some clear problem areas here in the red and here in the red, right? And this is, again, this is really no work being done except by behind the scenes by the ML. And I'll, I'll, I'll highlight what these red pieces mean in a sec. But I just want to click on this Nginx um, and we get a tabular view, again, uh, 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 an amalgam amalgamation and integration of multiple data sources. Um, you, you have uh, you have the actual SLO violation saying it's over 41% violating. Um, we are, because of eBPF, we can see the flow of the requests and we can see which is the highest latency path. In this case, it goes from Nginx to web server to card cache to card server to DB server, which you're seeing back here. And RML has also learned what's normal, right? So expected behavior for card cache and expected behavior for DB server is out of normal, right? You're at over a second and over 2.4 seconds respectively. Um, we know this is not some sort of uh, um, increased request issue because again, we're also bringing in data uh, related to the, to the URL um, request count and this is actually going down. So it's not an increased request problem. Um, so really, what is it? Well, we can jump into, we, if we wanted to, we could jump into each of these individual components, but we know we don't have to, and nobody's going to do that because, you know, we, you know, as operators, you're trying to get and resolve the issues as fast as possible. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to click on this red, and it's going to take me actually back into that alert we were just looking at. So what happened, and I'll, I'll just go back and I'll go back a sec. What happened is that the ML actually detected that for this particular anomaly, it brought in this completely discrete anomaly that we were looking at earlier. It's completely separate, but it brought it in and said, you know what, this is likely a contributor or a cause to your to your um, SLO violation. And what happens is now I'll actually go into these that we were looking at earlier, which, by the way, are charted automatically here. So you don't have to, you know, you don't you don't have a message saying your I'll click here. Your response time is slow and then you go in some other tool and then go to the different dashboard. It's all in here. Um, and this is you know automatically charted for you. You can see that the response time has increased by close to 2,000%. You can see that the response bytes themselves have increased. The size went from one meg to you know, close to eight megs. Um, incoming response time for requests coming into this particular you know, card cache container, the response time has increased by 1,500%. CPU utilization has increased by about 50%. But finally, the real piece is the image, right? So this is now um, leveraging all the open source data and bringing it together saying you have an image regression, right? You were running version 0.6 and now you're running version 0.4. Um, so that's really the issue, right? We have we have a, a bad image that way that's a well-known you know, 0.4 is, is broken. So that's really the cause. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm out of time, so I'll hand it back to to you, Alok, and, uh, and sure. to you as well. Um, yeah, so thanks. So I want to kind of cap a couple of comments and leave it for folks who are attending uh, to have Q&A. What, what we just showed was, in fact, if you looked at what we just did here, that response time change in SLO came from eBPF, an open source component that's already there. We didn't have to do anything. The metric changes came from Prometheus and eBPF for every container and the flows. The configuration change we detect from Kubernetes state metrics, for example, right? So. Uh, when we look and see an event change, if there's a log or event, we can bring that in. We haven't shown the traces. We can drill down, uh, which is still in the works, which will be shortly out. We can pull in the trace at that time to see exactly what happens to even further confirm. But the point is, all of this data is there, freely available. You can install it. You can do this. But the whole idea is, why should you be looking and checking metrics across a thousand containers with 5,000 dashboards of logs and metrics, observability requires us to be able to quickly isolate the problem and go there. And that's what we are saying. Open source monitoring has released all the data that's available that we need for telemetry and changes, even dynamically. Let's embrace that. Add this intelligence on top. You can do it. 
we are just showing you a way how we can do it and make your life simpler. That was the whole part, right? So if I were to just, you know, just summarize and, and then open up for questions uh, and then just emphasize this, I think this is worth highlighting again. You know, we have all these open CNCF metrics, open telemetry is there, metrics, logs, traces, eBBF. Yes, if you had S2, we can also deal with that by the way, but you don't have to touch any Kubernetes, even changes as we are going on. Just using that and this workflow once you have, that's where the intelligence is, right? And that's kind of what we are emphasizing. I'll Great. leave it there and pause for questions. Great. <clears throat> Sorry. Excuse me. Um, so really great, amazing presentation, really good, very in-depth demo. Always happy to see those. Thank you so much. So as said previously, now is the, the, the time to ask the questions. You can leave them in the chat. Um, I'll be helping here to moderate the Q&A. Um, but let's get started and let's kick off with a few of my questions. Um, so um, I know you mentioned a bit about Prometheus as well as uh, how you play with other CNCF tooling and open source tooling and whatnot, how these play into this. Do you want to a bit expand on how do you work with Prometheus monitoring framework, or or is did, did you cover everything that you wanted to to talk about there already? I think we did, and if um, you know, if you go back to that screen to uh, Cesar, you noticed how when we deploy Prometheus itself, right, and with that, just like you would today in your Kubernetes cluster, as a daemon said, enable the C advisor metrics, enable Node Explorer. That's all we are pulling together. I think what we've added, uh, if you think about it, because we needed what we call layer seven metrics, is we now leveraged eBPF as well, which is another open standard. That now gives us the coverage of networking, not only at the bytes and packets, but also the request rates at the URL level, response time, essentially gives us golden signals. So nothing out of the ordinary, as long as we have that coverage. We're using Prometheus you know, as a time series database. So um, you'll, you know, leveraging the exporters just easily sends that data or, you know, the data is scraped by Prometheus um, for, for all those exporters. So um, yeah, that's the, all the metrics that you see, whether they're network metrics or um, uh, or, or the uh, C advisor, you know, container metrics or node metrics, whatever, all that's being fed into Prometheus and that's where we're grabbing all those metrics from. So it's actually a really key uh, component to the observability layer. Perfect. Uh, we don't have too much time left, but I do want to ask a question because uh, we went to kind of the, the latest and greatest, I guess, of observability and monitoring here. So what do you think are going to be the next steps for, for this scene? What will be the, either for obscures, what are the, the upcoming features or what will the whole space be moving into the future and what will be the focus? Absolutely. By the way, we will be at KubeCon in person next week. Really looking forward to that after the last two years. So hopefully we'll talk to more folks who are you know, who are really working on cloud native. Uh, one of the things we didn't show is we are adding tracing, open telemetry with Jaeger. That brings up more. Um, you know, adding more and more capability on the causal analysis pieces so they can work and try to do fixes. We didn't show, for example, there are some issues uh, that we are adding to, like whether it's issues related to Kubernetes faults and failures that stop at start time and runtime, whether it's application level, we are adding more capabilities that are more knowledgeable about a known uh, application awareness, like how does a Kafka behave, what to look for those metrics. I mean, even those have Prometheus exporters with them. So now we can even drill down deeper into understand a specific problem with Kafka a specific problem with an open source database like MySQL. So that gives us even more granularity to understand what the problems are, right? And of course we start adding traces. Yeah, and I think at a, you know, as a, in the overarching space, I think, um, but I think, you know, the, the whole concept of, of bringing multiple sources of data together is really um, where the industry is starting to come in, right? And, and adding that, that, that intelligence, you know, uh, Obscus is not the only uh, company that's doing that, though I think, you know, we're, we're doing some pretty cool things, but you'll notice that more and more are starting to integrate um, the tools together, right? Because there's there's a lot of value to be had um, from not isolating the individual tools. Um, I think the industry is starting to come to realize that. So that and uh, putting smarts into um, into whatever platform is, is kind of like the next phase, the future of, uh, of observability. Yeah. I, I do want to reemphasize that. The fact that with what has happened in the last three, four years, you know, two years ago, Kubernetes became a standard. 
Now we have the full ecosystem of instrumentation. It's for anyone going to cloud native, you know, embrace the open source and monitoring and then add the intelligence where they really need it. That's what we see the community and it's taken a while, you know, but it doesn't matter if you're an enterprise customer with a lot of legacy application moving to cloud or a new startup. Uh, so we highly recommend that. Embrace these open sources, build on it. Uh, that gives you more power and brings more capability into your hands. Perfect. And perfectly on time as well as far as the timing of the, the session and the Q&A goes. So uh, perfectly wrapped there as well. So thank you everyone for joining the latest episode with Cloud Native Live. It has been really great to have Ops Cruise um Cesar and Alok talking about next generation observability using open source monitoring it has been an absolute pleasure and um, we really um are amazing and happy to see so many attendees joining in as well and thank you so much for for tuning in as well and we will be bringing cloud native tv obviously on every Wednesday going forward as well but actually next week will we have we will have KubeCon and therefore we will have a break because there's so much going on already in the cloud native space next week so no need for for our live stream. But after that, we have a session on supply chain security. So in two weeks, tune in to hear more about that. But thank you so much for joining us today and, and see you next week, everyone. And see us at KubeCon. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Ed.